Le Mans 24 Hours has been going since 1923. And in the following near century, there have been one or two oddities that have taken part. Weird they might be, but God loves a trier. So, these are actually some of our favourite races every year. In order to pick our favourites, we're going to ignore moments when the rules allowed an entire strange class to take part, like when NASCARs raced in 1976 to celebrate the bicentennial of the US Declaration of Independence. Instead, we'll focus on the truly strange attempts that have legitimately entered Le Mans in an existing class. Starting with something really odd. And if you do enjoy this video, please do remember to give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more from Goodwood Road and Racing. Briggs Cunningham was a name at the centre of pretty much all American sports car racing in the 1950s. A love affair with Jaguars saw some legendary machines painted in his famous white and blue, and that in turn later led to some extraordinary racing machines penned under his own name. But early in his career, when he was still exploring racing outside of the US, Cunningham hedged his bets by taking some all-American machinery to Le Mans. He raced at the 1950 Le Mans 24 Hours with a pair of Cadillac Series 61s. As Cunningham hedged his bets, one car would race in its standard body, the other would be given an extraordinary experimental aerodynamic shell. The body they gave the 61 was so bizarre, the French scrutineers spent hours examining it when it arrived in La Sarthe, refusing to believe there could be a standard 61 chassis underneath. Standard chassis there was, but so hated by the locals was it, they gave it the name that has stuck to this very day, Le Monstre. We'll let you work out what that means in English. Designed in a wind tunnel normally used to design slow-flying crop-dusting planes, Le Monstre was able to do 130 miles an hour, 13 more than its sister car. Sadly, it never really showed its true potential, crashing out into one of the sandbanks that then lined the track, where Cunningham was forced to dig Le Monstre out by hand. Top Gear broke during the crash, and Le Monstre struggled home to 11th, one place behind the standard machine. There are a couple of cars on this list that look like cars, just odd ones. Then there are a couple that have truly bonkers bits that make them weird. Then there's the Nardi Bissiluro 750, a car that looks like the love child of a menage a trois between a 60s F1 car, a sidecar, and a U2 spy plane. The theory is spelled out in its name. Nardi, of steering wheel fame, made racing cars in 1955. Bissiluro roughly translates as twin torpedo, and 750 stood for the teeny 55 horsepower BMW motorbike engine it stowed inside. And I say stowed because it was tucked into just one side of this bonkers machine like it was the passenger in a sidecar. Looking, as the name suggests, like two torpedo tubes, Nardi was aiming for a low drag and ideal weight distribution for the 750. Driver on one side, engine on the other, barely anything in between except for a giant radiator. Entered into the 1955 Le Mans 24 hours, the car apparently weighed less than 500 kilograms, and legend has it that its non-finish was down to being literally blown off the track by a passing D-type. Oh, and we haven't even mentioned that it had an oval steering wheel. The 787B is here not because it looks odd, but because it sounds odd. It's Valentino Rossi, everybody, in the Mazda 787B. There's been plenty of innovative attempts to design a Le Mans racer with an unusual power plant, but this one must be the most famous. The 787B used a 2.6-litre, four-rotor, naturally aspirated rotary engine. If you've never heard the 787B, well, then you're missing out. <laughs> Arguments will rage forever as to the sound that it makes. Some say it's an incredible sound, a real thing of beauty. Others argue it's just loud. And if the impact of the noise it made wasn't enough, Mazda wrapped the 787B in a lurid green and orange livery, just so you knew it was there. The 787B was never actually the fastest car racing at Le Mans, but 
As the new era of 3.5 litre Le Mans cars was just starting, and while Jaguar brought its XJR14 and Peugeot its 905, it was just a little bit more reliable, finishing two whole laps clear of the field. It wasn't the easiest to drive though, with Johnny Herbert pretty much passing out after he crossed the finish line, so exhausted that he actually missed the podium ceremony. Another entry to this list that came into being to be an aerodynamic test bed. But this one actually won. The Type 57G was a super low drag version of the Type 57 sports car, the one that spawned the monstrously valuable Atlantic. Amazingly, this car raced in Grand Prix as well as the Le Mans 24 hours and won both, claiming the Duville Grand Prix in 1936 and Le Mans in 1937. It was powered by a 3.25 litre straight eight engine and was capable of over 120 miles an hour. It gained its nickname of Tank, the second Bugatti to do so, because of its rather butch appearance, with an incredibly bluff front and long tapered rear making it look much bigger than it really is. Only one of these cars remains to this day, which was allegedly hidden in Bordeaux as the Germans marched across France in 1940. As if that wasn't enough, in the haste to keep the Bugatti from the Nazis, it was crashed on the way to its hiding place, overturning and requiring a comprehensive rebuild. We've mentioned the Delta Wing's later sort of Elvis after the food era in our video on the ugliest racing cars ever. But the original Delta Wing was like nothing we'd ever seen before with two tiny front wheels mounted close together to reduce drag and tyre wear, a wide rear and a fin rather than any other aerodynamic aids. Except that you had seen it before, if you were paying attention, because the Delta Wing was originally a concept for a new generation of IndyCars set to be introduced in 2012. When IndyCar went with Delara and the DW12, the team behind Delta Wing, including the legendary Dr. Don Panos, turned it into a sports car. Ignore the Nissan badges plastering all over it, they were some very clever marketing from the Japanese manufacturer, this was a truly independent effort, attempting to create something radically different. And it worked. The Delta Wing was able to run at LMP2 speeds and was performing incredibly well, until it was hip-checked off the circuit at a restart by Kazuki Nakajima. The Delta Wing would go on to race for many years in the US, eventually becoming that rather regrettable coupe but it was the performance at Le Mans that deserved more than it received in return. And it did sort of return in 2013. Nissan's Ziod RC electric hybrid racer was designed by the same man and looked so similar, the Delta Wing sued. The Rover BRM makes this list by being both bonkers to look at and powered by something truly strange. A partnership between, you guessed it, Rover and BRM, the Rover BRM was designed to be very aerodynamically efficient and then it was powered by a gas turbine. Rover had worked on gas turbines in road cars since World War II and had run demonstration laps in various prototypes before the 1962 24 hours. But then the ACO upped the stakes by adding a prize for any gas turbine car that could complete 3,600 kilometers during the race. And though nobody knows it at this stage, it's going to make racing history. The car did it at its first attempt, passing the 3,600 mark with hours to spare, and at one point doing more than 140 miles an hour down the Mulsanne Strait. If it weren't entered into a non-classified experimental class, the Rover BRM would have finished an amazing eighth in 1963. It failed to enter the 1964 race, either due to limited time to test a new engine or damage in transport, depending on whose story you believe, but ran in 1965, finishing a creditable 10th. The best description of this extraordinary machine came from Graham Hill, who raced the car in 63 and 65 and said, you're sitting in this thing that you might call a motor car, and the next minute it sounds as if you've got a 707 behind you, about to suck you up and devour you like an enormous monster. Our final car was designed with one purpose and one purpose alone, to be the fastest car ever down the Mulsanne Strait. Gerard Velter, a well-known race car design madman, had been entering sports cars into the great race since the 1970s, but with little success and just as little funding. 
For 1987, he and business partner Michel Mounier hatched a plot to make some headlines. Rather than win the race, the two Peugeot employees would instead build a car to become the first to ever hit 400 kilometers an hour at Le Mans. Starting with their P86 racing car, Velter and Mounier were handed some covert help from Peugeot, who liked the idea of the attempt, or at least the marketing around it, in the form of access to its wind tunnels. But only on Sundays, which just happened to be when Peugeot wasn't using them. The result was the super streamlined P88, a car so dedicated to aero efficiency that even the wing mirrors are enclosed to reduce drag. A 3-litre Peugeot engine was squeezed into the back and with some nifty wizardry, 910 horsepower was extracted along with a bonkers 1,020 newton metres of torque. So important became this attempt to Peugeot and the French organisers that a new radar system was installed specifically to measure its speed and then replaced in mid-practice when it didn't appear to be registering the speeds correctly. Come race day though, everything was set and the P88 set out for its attempt. A few teething issues initially hampered it, but after hours of repair, Roger Dorchy finally did it, hitting a dizzying 407 kilometers an hour, or 253 miles an hour. The car, having done its duty, duly overheated and retired, but the work was done. Later, the number was changed to 405 kilometers an hour to help Peugeot launch its new road car. But what did two kilometers an hour matter to Velter and Mounier? Those are our favourite weird racing cars to ever race at Le Mans. But what are yours? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs>